This is uh, Debaj Mullen is uh, the name of uh, the presentation. Awesome. Thank you so much. I got my cup of coffee. I need to have this. This is fuel. But uh, Debaj Mullen means storytelling in uh, the Ojibwe language. And one of the things that I really like to try to get across is how do we make history more accessible to people and make it so that uh, it is something that everybody has a stake in and feels that they can make part of their lives. And so myself, um, I'm a Turtle Mountain Chippewa Métis from the Turtle Mountain community in North Dakota. My name is Cade Ferris. Uh, I attended the University of North Dakota and North Dakota State University majoring in anthropology. I had a research specialization in ethno history and my research specialty was on the development of the uh, Métis and the Ojibwe people in North Dakota and the Red River Valley. Uh, and that's what I, what I did my research on. I've uh, served as Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa for a good part of the last 20 years, uh, and then I've also been for the last eight years the Historic Preservation Officer for the Red Lake Band of Chippewa in Minnesota. And it's a great uh, position to be in because you can help really work with communities to develop a variety of strategies to preserve uh, uh, history and to preserve uh, archaeological sites, those type of things. My interest in colorization of historical photos was a hobby. It was a really interesting hobby, <laughs> how I got started in it. Uh, I had a friend who said, hey, check this out. I colorized a photo using an AI program. And I was like, that's really neat. What program? And so he showed me. And uh, it was kind of neat that it put a little bit of color onto a thing, but it was very um, washed out, it didn't look very very good. It was very, uh, looked like a, computer, like a computer made it or uh, <laughs> a robot made it. And so it was a, it was around Christmas and I decided, you know, there's got to be a better way to do this to try to make things look more realistic so that we can really, you know, bring them to life. And so for the past uh, three or so years, I've been working on colorizing photos as a hobby, uh, as a way to promote history and to present it to the public at large. And it's great when I see people using my photos uh, online. I know it's like people say, why don't you, you know, copy, you know, write them and, you know, all that. Because I've actually had people uh, take my uh, colorizations and sell them online. And I was like, you know, yeah, I, you know, you kind of hate people to do that with your art. But at the same time, uh, just to have people enjoy it and use it, especially people who've asked me to help with their family photos, uh, repairing photos, like uh, photos that have been deeply cracked or scarred, and to bring those back to life so they can have their, you know, great grandparents or their grandparents' uh, photos fixed. I'll do that for fun. And just to see people utilizing them and sharing little bits of history that they themselves had using my photo to help uh, demonstrate that it's a win because I really like to see the public engaged in history in a really good way. And so I operate and maintain a website called the Baja Moen, um, and that of course means storytelling, as I said. And it was just a way to provide interesting information about the Ojibwe, Métis, and other indigenous people of the region. I, I like small history. I don't know, it's a, a term that ever gets used, but nothing bores people more than these gigantic history books that try to cover from the dawn of time to now. And it's very much dry, focused on dates. It's not something that's digestible or palatable to a lot of people. When I was a kid growing up, I loved reading Reader's Digest stupid little magazine my grandma would get and I'd always look through there and hey that's a really neat little story this person is telling 
those, uh, I guess, little ethnographies, you know, I survived the bear attack. And it's just like, wow. And I'd read that and just it was fascinated. And I'm like, well, you know, all these stories, they mean something, but really they don't reach a lot of people. But at the same time, when people see those or hear those, you know, they valorize them. They put them into their body, in their mind, and they want to share them. I know I, I love boring my kid here <laughs> with um, stories like that. Humans me, but at the same time, I hope that, you know, it's going to be something that's going to uh, stick. And that's the whole idea. Uh, now, as far as photography, when you think about it, pho photography is super duper uh, new <laughs> in the grand scheme of things. Uh, in 1939, the, uh, the daguerreotype photographic process was first introduced to the United States by an Englishman named D.W. Seeger, and he started taking photographs of some of the buildings in New York City. That's, nine, that's 1839, really. It's less than 200 years ago when photography finally hit. But when you think about out here on the prairies, it didn't hit for a long time after that. And so in the years leading up to the Civil War, they had new technology, which is the Clodian wet plate photographic process, which had negatives and you could replicate and use a dark room, but that's the key. You had to have a dark room. <laughs> and so photography is confined to cities where studios and labs could be established. And out here, where something didn't take place until, you know, right around that uh, end of the Civil War, when that happened, you didn't see the first photographs really starting to happen until after that time period. And photography first came to the Minnesota and Dakota Territory region during that time, with the earliest photographs being taken at studios in Minneapolis, St. Paul, Winnipeg, you know, really nothing out this way, uh, you know, at that time. Some of the earliest subjects of the photographs were Native Americans. And the purpose of showing indigenous people to consumers in the Eastern states and for preservation purposes, because these are vanishing people, according to uh, every audience. You know, let's document them and uh, let's, you know, promote them. And so the earliest photographs in Minnesota, 1862, According to the National Archives, this picture on the left there, or your left, yes, um, <laughs> Old Bets, that was 1862, that photograph. And it's a postcard. Uh, the earliest photograph in North Dakota, 1868, was in the Rickra Man. And that is a, stereos a stereoscope photo. That was a process that came out just around the same time. You'll see a lot of old uh, photos in that mid-century uh, period with these uh, overlapping ones, you could actually put on your goggles and kind of see them 3D <laughs> in a way. But those, I mean, when you think about it, that is really um, late. And that's just, you know, in these large uh, cities where they're able to get people to come in for photographs or to actually sit somebody out uh, like that one in North Dakota actually was a rarity. They took it outside. <laughs> you listen, he's sitting at, a, or at an earth lodge. Photography was extensively used in constructing Native Americans as exotic, irrelevant, and on the way to extinction and assimilation. That was a big early reason why is these are the people that are no longer here. These are the people that are vanishing. The uh, you know disappearing Indians. That whole idea led to so many of these photographs being taken. And this was really important in pushing the representation of the mid 19th century well into the 20th century. When you started to see things like uh, photographs being taken at boarding schools, the uh, marketing of uh, Save the Indian uh, or Save the Man, Kill the Indian, uh, the idea of civilizing. And so you see it, it's really kind of a weird. Uh, trajectory because those early pictures from you know the 1860s and in the 1870s you'll see natives dressed in a mixture of European clothes and some of their own uh, natives uh, regalia and items through that early period of photography then 
when people started to really settle in this area, they didn't want to see that. Then it was a movement towards studio shots with beaded vests and finery and all these things where oftentimes it wasn't traditional material at all. It would be, you know, basically items that were owned by the photographer. And so sometimes you see the same items being used twice. Um, one photograph I found a person had, the photographer had stuck a feather duster into a head because he wanted to have that native look. On the uh, flip side, we had people like uh, Curtis. I'm sure you've seen some of his famous photographs. Edward Curtis, he took a lot of these iconic shots. They would often go out of their way to show natives, quote, as they really were. But in fact, <clears throat> it was carefully posed renderings, prop clothing items, staged. Everything was uh, more or less marketed to that particular view to satisfy that stereotype of the noble savage, the disappearing Indian. They didn't want to see people dressed in a suit and tie or a dress. They would literally dress them up. And those Curtis photographs are very popular. You'll see people have a copy of a book of Curtis photographs. And you look at that, they're all staged. And Native people, as they actually were during that time period, the late 1800s to early 1900s, they didn't think of them as being Indians anymore, in a sense. If you weren't frozen into, into that noble savage mindset, then you weren't real. And so they would really go overboard on the, some of the beadwork photographs of some people and you know, stage those photos. This is a really classic staging of a photo. This is Mary Louise Botno Baldwin. It shows her with braided long hair covered up by a blanket. It's that blanket Indian, that Indianness uh, shown as in that, in, in, with that blanket, uh, you know, the, it's a stereotype. But in reality, she was an attorney. She was one of the highest ranking officials in the early 20th century Department of Indian Affairs. She was one of the first natives to break through in the Department of Indian Affairs. And yet she's tokenized in this photograph. She's, her, her, her education, her station, what she had earned was erased in a way. It's like, I like this photograph because it's such a clear photograph of such an important person. But at the same time, it's tokenizing her to a point where she shouldn't be tokenized. She actually led that effort to recruit and train elected official, educated officials into the Indian Affairs Department, which led to the modern day uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs, which is run mostly by natives now. It was because of people like her. She was also an early suffragette um, in the uh, women's uh, suffrage movement, but she was driven out because she was native. So she was part of that initial Washington, D.C. native uh, uh, movement, but also part of the suffragette movement. And her father was um, Pemina Chippewa citizen, Turtle Mountain Band, J.B. Botna, who was the tribal attorney for the Turtle Mountain Band, pressing the tribe's claims up until the 1900s. And that's where she received her, her Washington, D.C. education is because he was out there working on behalf of the tribes and their treaty settlement, and she was assisting him on that. But I think this photograph really drives that home. This is 1914. Why did they have to put her in that blanket? You know, why did they have to do that when she was probably better educated than the man taking her photograph? You know, almost certainly. The most interesting photos, in my opinion, are photos of the various tribal delegates that went to Washington, D.C. during the treaty-making period, the late 1800s, early 1900s, because you'll see these tribal chiefs and other delegates wearing their European clothes, their suits, their collar shirts, their all these symbols of Euro-American uh, business attire, 
but at the same time throwing in elements of their own travel regalia. And the wearing of these suits and these and this business attire sent a message uh, that the tribal representatives were leaders who had a high position to negotiate with the United States, but at the same time, they were also sending a message that they were representing their own people. And so it's kind of really cool to see uh, a suit with that, you know, with a, uh, a bonnet or a bandolier or even holding a, a pipe or a sword. It did send a message that they weren't disappeared, that they were living, you know. See those pictures. Funny, a lot of people have expressed to me that they don't like colorizing photos. And I asked why, well, because they're supposed to be black and white. I'm like, well, no, well, that's the way it is. But like, it's technology, guys. You know, they, you know, you wouldn't be presenting yourself that way at the time, there was no colored photos. There was no colored film. But you saw hand colorization. We're going to talk about that, too. This is great. I love this. The picture on the, on the left here, he's wearing a blue tie, a white-colored shirt. And it's tied perfectly with the tie pin on the top. But he also is wearing traditional Ojibwe bandolier bags um, across himself, a silk scarf tied onto his otter turban. And he was one of the uh, 1908 uh, Chippewa delegation from Minnesota uh, to Washington, DC. And it's really neat to see that, that blending or on the, on the right side, uh, red robe, he is wearing a full suit with uh, uh, his headdress, his pipe and a necklace. And I think that uh, that is really interesting. One thing I thought was interesting was another delegation from 1898. There's these men from the Chippewa delegation wearing these massive coats. And I was like, oh, wow, that's pretty hot. They had no nothing um, native with them as far as headdresses or anything, but they were in these massive coats in their photographs. And I was like, wow, wow, we know this had to be in the middle of winter. And I found out what happened. This is a cool story. Uh, the, the delegation from Turtle Mountain, they actually walked from Belcourt to Devil's Lake to get on the train in the middle of January in 40 below weather with these massive coats on. And there was a state senator in the 1950s who told the story in the chambers. And I was reading the transcript and I was like, just blown away. He said he was a kid. This has been back, you know, a 1910 delegation, I think, that, what, that came through. He said uh, in the middle of the night, they were sleeping. They lived outside of uh, Church's Ferry in that area. He said, in the middle of the night, we heard our door open. We heard people come in. And I went to my dad's room and said, Dad, there's people in the house. He said, just stay quiet. Maybe they'll leave. Well, he didn't think about it. They were up pretty much all night in their rooms, kind of shaking and quaking. But in the morning, they smelled bacon cooking. And when they went downstairs, it was the uh, Turtle Mountain delegates who had brought their own food with and cooked the meal in the house and fed the people before they walked the rest of the way, the other 30 miles to Devil's Lake. And you're going, wow, that takes some dedication to do that. And so when they did show up and they did get their photos taken, they were wearing street clothes big coats, and they weren't uh, wearing any regalia. I suppose in the middle of winter would have been counter, you know, intuitive to be carrying your regalia with you as you were traipsing to the train station. And so just the stories you can find or infer from some of these photographs, I think are really important. Uh, this is great. These are from 1874. It's going back a little bit further from those other photos. And again, you'll see some of the uh, European clothing, like the nice uh, black suit, but yet he's got his blanket, he has a bandolier bag, he's wearing a turban. Uh, or Mozamo, he has a sword in his pipe. The sword is neat because I, I, tried, I wanted to track down what sword that was and where it was from. And it was actually a, uh, a Shriner sword that uh, was used as Shriner Ceremonial Sword. I've been trying to figure out, well, how on earth did, 
you know, he get his hands on a Shriner ceremonial sword. You know, was it presented during a treaty delegation or what? Also, the medal that he's wearing on his chest, I was telling Marcus a story about that, is we had found it during an excavation, uh, a small, maybe a, a silver dollar size uh, coin, but it wasn't a coin. It had a, a nice, neat hole through the top of it. And so we started calling around different uh, experts on coins and experts on Indian peace medals. And it came to, we came to find out that what it was, was during this time, the chief would usually get a large medal when he would sign the treaty or negotiate. But some of the other um, headmen and chiefs wanted those medals as well, but they couldn't be giving out 200 medals or 20 medals. And so they would take along at these uh, treaty meetings, these smaller silver dollar sized medals. And we found out they were kind of like uh, mass produced, not like, you know, a large extent, but they were being given out to uh, uh, these Indian agents to hand out at these, at these uh, treaty delegations. Now, unfortunately, the majority of historical photos do not accurately depict real lives of grassroots people. Uh, the majority of photos that you see in history are chiefs, leaders, significant figures, and other notable persons. And why? Well, studio portraits, I, as I mentioned earlier, you had to travel to cities usually to get a studio portrait, and that was expensive. It might not have occurred to, you know, to just the regular uh, mom and pop to, you know, be able to get a photograph. Also, uh, a lot of the cities and towns are quite a ways away from uh, reservations. And so you would only see some of these notable chiefs uh, being photographed. Where that changed is during the residential boarding school era. Um, sometimes those are the only photographs that some families will have of their ancestors during the late 1800s, early 1900s. If you look through some of the old archives or old photographs, you might be able to find photographs of uh, your family members. Like my grandmother and her sisters, they were taken from their parents and sent to Indian Mission Boarding School when they were little. And the only photograph I was able to find of them ever was a staged photograph that was used by the mission to raise funds, uh, showing their little tribe. They would uh, actually take them out to the large cities and they would uh, dance around and they would solicit funds for the mission school. And so my grandma and her sisters in 1934, I found a photograph at the Blue Cloud Abbey of my grandma. She's the uh, young lady to the uh, second from the young man with the large headdress. She's right next to him there. And to see that photo of her is just was mind blowing. And the other girls, the two in the middle and the one in the back uh, in the black, those are her sisters. And there's no photographs. The school wasn't going to waste money on taking a lot of photographs in the 1930s, obviously. This was used as a promotion. And of course, the clothing wasn't authentic. These were costumes. They would make these costumes and just then get catered to uh, benefactors in Chicago, in Omaha, in Minneapolis. They would take them there once or twice a year, these kids, because they could uh, try to raise money. And I was really lucky to find this because it's one of only two photographs of my grandmother as a child. The other photograph is probably taken the exact same day. It's her actually sitting kind of uh, uh, on the floor like the boy is in front of this one. And so a lot of these photographs like this, they don't have happy backstories. I mean, it's kind of neat because these kids are smiling, I suppose, because they were probably on a trip to Chicago and got some special treats. But at the end of the day, this is exploitative. It was uh, raising money, you know, on, the same, on, on these kids at the same time trying to erase their culture and, uh, you know, and you know, divest them from their families. I tried to colorize it a little bit. It was a hard photo to even blow up and try to fix. It was a very hard photo to try to fix. I got some color into it, not as much as I would like to. And so I was able to put a little bit into it. But at the same time, it's nice to see 
you know, if you can find that, because a lot of times, like I said, unless it was a very important person, you don't find those photos of your grandparents, uh, except for these boarding school photos. Now, colorization is really interesting. Um, the colorization of photos dates back to the 1800s. They were colorized by hand using very, various dyeing techniques, dyeing the photographs, uh, using sometimes overlaying. Once, the, once they were able to do negatives, they could dye each negative a different color and overlay it to create a master. And so colorization was like desirable, even back then. To be in black and white, like, well, no, they weren't, you know, people really tried their hardest to colorize. Nowadays, of course, colorization can be done using various paint and image programs and apps. You can get things in your phone to colorize, but still, like I said, AI systems, they can colorize, but the colorizations tend to be wrong because AI can't understand those nuances of culture, color, shading. They just can't do what the human eye can do. We can see that, we can research it. Significant historical research and knowledge is required to colorize realistically. I mean, you have to do a lot of looking at uh, artifacts, going to museums. I've spent a lot of time doing museum reviews for uh, the tribe that I work for, where you can go to the museum, look to see some of these uh, original uh, works and uh, look at the color, look at the scheme, what colors look good, but then also intuitiveness and artistry are needed. What looks good? What color looks good? What color, you know, is going to look best? And it might take hours or days to colorize an image. I mean, literally, um, I'll go with a mouse and click, 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 <laughs> click, and you make a hundred mouse clicks and then pull shaders, uh, you know, change the tone, what looks good, what color, because you're, you know, at the end of the day, all color is, is basically, you know, four colors that are blended together. And so you were trying to blend percentages. Then once you get that uh, blended, you might blend again and again, and it might take a long time. Now, colorized photos, of course, aren't substitute the original, but what they are is a way to augment and bring greater understanding to the public at large. That's the key. I mean, really, I, I can't stress that enough is I love colorizing photos because I want people to enjoy them. Sometimes people, you know, they'll be on Facebook and post a picture of their grandma and it's a very grainy old photo. And I'll look at the photo and say, I think I can probably fix that. No, you know, take and talk to them and I'll say, hey, do you mind if I try doing this and see if I can help you out on this? And being able to fix some of those photos is really fun because sometimes it's the only photo they might have of their, you know, grandmother, great grandmother. Um, might be a, a picture from them when their mom was young or their dad. And just to be able to try to bring some life to it. Um, and they, oh, I remember that his, you know, his eyes were blue or, you know, he had, you know, the you know, most wonderful smile and you, you know, so how do you clear it up? Because I'll run it through a, a bunch of filters to try to take away the rough edges to sharpen things, to smooth things. Uh, and it's, it's rewarding to do. You know, I, I love it because it's, uh, it's, it's an art form. Both my parents were artists, and I was never an artist. I was a history geek. <laughs> I, I was what I was good at. So I, when I went to school, I did that. And I've always liked art, but I, how do you compete with a person who's got stuff in the Smithsonian? You know, you can't. His art's way better than mine. But this is mine. I'm able to make this something where I can really express myself, but at the same time, satisfy my need to help people to push history to the forefront. And with the internet now, it's fantastic. I mean, what you can do. Some photos I've posted have been, you know, shared hundreds of thousands of times. Um, you know, people have, you know, looked at it from all over the world. And it's, it's very rewarding to know that, um, you know, people are interested in history like that. I love these pictures, you know, 
black and white the color. This one, uh, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna tap on myself now because I, I made a mistake. If you look at the uh, bone pipe on the bottom, I was able to get the colorization in there, the the color of stained older yellow bone pipe, but up by his neck, I forgot to colorize it. It's still black and white. <laughs> it's like now I go home and I'm gonna fix this. <laughs> But it's like, how did I not notice this a hundred times when I, when I looked at that, or how did I miss that? But really, it's not so bad. In a way, it's kind of cool that I missed it because that kind of shows, I know how the, you know, I mean, just getting those bone pipes to be that yellow with a little bit of white to get that that light was so much fur, like the uh, turban. That is the hardest thing to color. You think, well, first brown. How do you make brown? <laughs> you know, you have to put a little bit of purple in there, a little bit of red, a little bit of yellow, a little bit of blue. And so you're trying to find how do you make otter uh, skin? <laughs> how do you make that, that color? You know, and how do you make it so it, it looks natural and real? You know, those are, you know, very difficult things to do. The beadwork is fun because. In a way, you know, Ojibwe beadwork is pretty um, common. You'll see a lot of the same colors being used. That was not too terribly difficult. This is a great one. I love this one. But I'm, again, like I said, I, I made a mistake. It happens. But now I'm glad that I did because it really does show that off. This one's really cool, the, the one that I did. Um, this is uh, Big Knife. He's a, from Rocky Boy in Montana. Um, I don't know what color that blanket was. It might have been green. It probably was green, but I wanted something to stand out. There's where the artistry comes in as opposed to uh, trying to really buckle down on, you know, what color that might be. It could have been any color. I like the uh, kind of that red with the blue just to create something visually striking. Um, his hat definitely went for that more of that uh, that tan felt color and getting his his wrist to look sparkly like sequins those are sequins on there that was kind of a, a chore to really get that to look natural but i think it looks fantastic when you when you look at that because it looks like you're going to take in uh last year this one was uh another one that was fun to do and it took a lot of time coloring individual beads <laughs> um, and to really get that to stand out and I know Marcus was saying I like that you don't really change the color of the background too much like this one I have a very slight wash you know it it it, do, it doesn't clash with the uh, with the person and then to get um, leather colored correctly is really hard. What color would that leather be? Is it going to be a, a, you know, a light color, a dark color, um, reddish, tannish? A lot of that is speculation, but things like, uh, like this, they're so much fun because this is somebody's, you know, might have been somebody's grandma in the last, you know, uh, this is 1909, so I mean, she's almost certainly passed away, but at the same time, you know, this is, you know, hopefully somebody will recognize her and will enjoy it. And so I, I do, I spend a lot of time looking through archives, national archives, uh, and I have a lot of photographs available online that I've been going through and colorizing. Some of the ones I've been colorizing lately are some of those early BIA photographs from the 1930s during the uh, Work Power Administration, CCC. Uh, those are neat because they don't have that bias of boarding school. They don't have the staging with, uh, you know, making people put on something. They are people doing what people do. And so you'll see uh, a work crew building a bridge or women uh, teaching canning at a, a school. And those photographs are awesome. And also because a lot of those photographs, people will recognize the people in those photos. 
And they get really excited because, oh, that's my great grandma. You know, and it's just like, yes, you know, we did something that's going to make somebody happy. Um, Louis Riel, this photograph I thought was fun because you don't see any good photographs of him. There's like probably a handful of photographs of him. And this brought him to life, I thought. It changes the perspective. You can, you can actually see the crease in his forehead. Uh, I was able to get that crease in there. And I, you know, I, I've actually had the uh, Canadian Métis um, provincial governments use some of my uh, photographs like purposes, which is really nice too, to just know that people want to be able to use things like that for, uh, you know, for helping promote culture and uh, learning. This one's a very recent one. So it's 72 years old, 1950. I liked it because the leather, it didn't seem like a big, you know, real yellowish leather. It looked like a much more rich, dark leather. And so I was able to do that uh, color, the beadwork. You know, at the time period during the 50s, you saw a lot of a lot of uh, Pony Trader blue and yellow being used. Uh, and so it was colorized. This one was a lot of fun. It took a long time too. I mean, just literally pixel by pixel trying to colorize it, trying to brighten her face a little bit. That was a real treat. This one I like too. It's a stage studio photograph, but it's not staged with fake regalia. In my estimation, this is real because you have two gentlemen that are dressed in their European uh, clothing. And you have the older gentlemen who are wearing uh, traditional clothing, but they're also Lakota, and they're wearing what is Lakota regalia. Uh, one of the things that I always look for is in the photograph is are the people um, in something that's not appropriate for the region. And so you'll see somebody who might be, uh, you know, Ala like Alaskan wearing a headdress. Say, no, this is you know not you know culturally relevant. It's stage. This one I like too. It's um, 1858 is one of the earliest photographs in the region. There's a couple of other photos, but this one I like because, again, he's wearing this uh, beautiful blue, uh, which is a traditional Métis uh, capote. Um, he has his leg garters on. He has corduroys on. This is the perfect Métis clothing for a man during that time period. Um, I know a lot of people will, oh, their Métis wore a sash and a candy-striped uh, white blanket, a Hudson Bay blanket, capote. Well, no, those are stereotypes that were promoted in the last 50, you know, 60 years. Um, the historical documentation, you know, always speaks of this, uh, very vibrant blue, which would stand out on the prairie. It was uh, almost gaudy, you'd hear people talk about, or these, these leg garters that would, you know, that would be used, uh, you know, the moccasins, the, the hat. These are all very distinctly Red River Métis. They're distinct, and he has the buffalo robe behind him. Everything here is historically perfect and i loved it but 1858 you don't see really uh you know there's nothing staged about it it's very much just there and i think that's something that's very important to do um i was going to introduce you to my uh website as well uh, the Bajamoan is the uh, site. I Bajamoan.com and I colorize this photo. It's really cool. I actually the hardest photos to colorize are outdoor photos. <laughs> um, there's nothing more difficult than coloring grass. You know because grass 
is grass. I mean, how do you get that right shade of yellow, green, brown? Uh, yeah, and then oh, getting to, you know, the teepees done, everything here, this was a really fun one to do. It took forever, I love it, it's still one of my favorite ones. But what it is, it's, I love what, I love the statement. Stories are, and I gotta get my glasses on because I'm absolutely blind. Our stories are a living history of our people collected over many lifetimes and passed down as a birthright and an inheritance. They've always been important in educating our youth and as a form of entertainment to get us through long winters and long nights in the forest and on the prairies. Storytelling is one of the few human traits that are truly universal across all cultures and throughout all of human history. On Earth, has stories, has storytellers. We don't venerate them as much as we should. Everybody has a grandma or an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent who's a, got a storyteller uh, tradition. There's even people in your family who might be able to just keep the dinner table engaged by talking about a movie. Those are storytellers, 21st century storytellers. The act of storytelling allows us as individuals and members of our respective communities to engage with the ideas of our ancestors while helping ourselves become better people today. That's the key too. I think that not everybody is ever going to be a cultural expert or a historian or, you know, a researcher, but everybody has the right to learn stories and to use stories to become better people, to teach their kids, to entertain them, and especially for Indigenous people. You know, storytelling is part of decolonization and it helps people to just bring an element of that tradition into their lives. And so I actually maintain a, a story blog on here. I love this photograph that I colored. <laughs> he was fantastic. Um, and also uh, here's some colorized photos on here as well, featured photos. There's some really nice ones. There we are. Those are some of the ones, some of the ones that I, I really liked. But the story blog is really, is really nice. So here we go. On here we have we have uh, various categories: categories about Métis, uh, Anishinaabe, um, books and literature, general culture, colorized photos. So some categories, and this one talks about uh, you know allotments and inherited wealth, about the allot the Homestead Act. Um, the Allotment Act and how land was being issued. Um, here's a small story, Bear Woman, a tragic tale. It's just a short um, legend that I like. Uh, but these are the kind of stories I've had people actually say that they read stories to their children from my blog at night and i try to source it so people can track down the source so like here 1932 ojibwe woman by ruth landis public university press that way people can do some research or some people will actually use some of this uh, material in uh research papers and uh thesis and it's great to you know at least be able to provide some of that information but to get some of these stories uh out there to the public i just really like to have that and this one here is a fun one it's just uh i just wanted to get some some actual photos of some of the artwork that's at the smithsonian just so people could have a chance to see it and then uh you know i mean i'd love to see more of this where museums have more more accessible collections online you know, I know it's like you want to get people through your doors because that's where you get your money. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, having the ability to see some of these things. 
yeah, it makes it makes it. I guess it makes people, I think, engaged more with it. But yeah, so it's a it's a really cool little web page that just has small stories, information. Um, I have a little uh, section on here, which has some databases for people who want to do their own research. Uh, Native American ethno ethnobotany database of the Library and Archives of Canada. I'll link directly to them. American Museum of Natural History, Smithsonian, uh, some Native American photos, Biodiversity Heritage Library, and then some historical books. You can just download them straight away. Um, some of the primary sources from the uh, early Red River Valley. Uh, some neat videos to just see. It, you know, I don't want to, you know, change the world. <laughs> I just want to make history more accessible. Uh, that's about the best thing I can do. And, and, and to make it, a, you know, to have it be a hobby, it means more. I mean, it's certainly not a business. Uh, I'd love to be, you know, you know, but I know history is not that popular. I mean, there's, you know, 10 people in the room here. So, but still, it's something that people can really, like I said, make part of their lives to incorporate into their knowledge base for themselves to you know share with their families their kids and to just learn i mean i i, I my day is not complete if i don't learn something even my son he likes hey dad look at this <laughs> you know, show me a, a silly story uh, you know cell phones internet uh you know it's all bringing things like archives to our fingertips now. It's bringing photographs, historical photographs, all this information that when I was uh, writing my thesis, which is almost 20 years ago, it's like, wow, I know they didn't have none of this stuff. I would have my thesis done, you know, a lot quicker if I would have had access to everything I have access to now. And, you know, to even share things, uh, a lot of uh, research gets shared. People are using uh, Zoom, Facebook Live, to uh, you know to bring this information to everybody. And so I think that one thing I really hope that people can do is to just enjoy uh, history and find a way to just make it part of you know your life, to make you, you know to really find joy in it. And that's why I did this. And it was all because my wife, uh, about five years ago, what do you want for Christmas? I said, I don't want anything. Uh, give you a pair of socks. She goes, oh, get something you like. And so I said, can I have a blog? <laughs> and, and, you know, because she's been telling me for years and years, you know, you have all these little stories you've been collecting. You know, why aren't you, uh, you know, writing these down before, you know, you know, it doesn't do no good if you're the only person who knows this stuff. And I was like, yeah, you know, you're right. And, writing a blog is great because I don't, I, like I said, I don't think that as much as I love to write, you know, for journals and things like that, who am I impressing? Other people who do the same thing. You know, some college kid might read it and use it for their thesis, but I want everybody to enjoy it, you know, who can get their hands on it. I want everybody to learn a little bit of something. And that's what this was all about, was just to share that information to make things more fun for people and to give myself something to do i mean uh but yeah, i i really like to just do research and if i find one paragraph in a 500 page uh fur trade journal that piques my interest i might go down that rabbit hole and yeah it's what you really you know want is public history that appeals to people. But yeah, thank you. Uh, enjoy the pictures downstairs. They're, they're fun to look at. Uh, a lot of work went into them. Uh, I had a really good time. Any, uh, any questions, really, I'd love to you know, hear from anybody. Um, there's a question on Zoom. Okay. Uh, Lisa Burns says, I may have missed it, but where do you find your images to colorize? Um, various archives. Uh, 
the National Archives uh, has a lot of their stuff online now. The Smithsonian does the same thing. Uh, the, the Library and Archives of Canada has a lot of stuff online. And it's just good to see, you know, good to find some of this stuff. A lot of stuff, um, like I said, sometimes people will post things like their, you know, old grandmother's photos or great grandmother's photos, great grandfather's photos. And I'll ask them if I can colorize the photo because I find it very striking and they find it very rewarding to get a colorized photo of their, you know, their ancestor. So um, it's just fun to do, you know, to, you know, to really just track down something that piques my interest. It's in a way, it's like art and history. One of my favorite things to do is I did this once just because I thought it was cool is I found like uh, Frida, Frida Kahlo uh, photographs. It's like, oh, I'm colorized Frida. And the hardest thing there was how do you colorize the stucco behind her? <laughs> it's like, that was hard. You know, colorizing Frida was easy. Colorizing the stucco of the house and to get the, sh the uh, shadows um, and the color to go through the shadows the various shadows was the hard part. And I was like, this is fun. So it, you know, sometimes it's because I want to look for something uh, specifically on the archives, but usually it's just, that's really neat. I want to, you know, I want to try that. Do you find like the colors between each like photos and the culture and the different tribes and stuff are like the same kind of colors? Or cool. how do you figure out which color to put on the picture? Uh, a, lot of, a lot of it has to do with what, uh, what was historically available. Uh, one thing that, you know, if you look at, at a lot of historical clothes, blue, blue is the number one color. And so sometimes I will, I, I just can't do blue. I can't be, I, I need to have some different color in here because blue was like number one color. It was, you know, the easiest to dye color clothes blue. Dyeing other colors just was not as easy to do. And so a lot of colors are blue, like clothing for beads, um, it really depends on you know the tribe, the time. That's why I say a lot of work kind of goes into trying to identify that, and a lot of research goes into it. But yeah, um, you know, just trying to you know to find because black and white, it's kind of cool because if you look at the black and white, you can really kind of say I can kind of see the color on that. Um, denim, <laughs> that's another thing too. I mean, you know, denim was very very you know uh, popular. Uh, but it, you know when it, when, de when denim came in, it was like because blue was the standard indigo dye. Uh, you know it could have been any color, but blue is just the easiest one to use. So it's like sort of that, yeah. Do you find that uh, are, are many of the photographers identified in the images you have, or some? Not yeah, some of them are. Um, and you can find, you know, like I said, some of the. Um, Repetitive culprits like uh, Curtis. I don't color as Curtis photographs because they're very disingenuous. <laughs> he staged them. Um, but at the same time, uh, there was another guy who kind of went through the region uh, back around 1908 who staged a lot of photographs. But at the same time, a lot of those people uh, have living relatives. And I colorized a lot of those photos because I wanted those people to be able to see their ancestor in, you know in color and to make those pictures look really uh you know boom well yeah a lot of them were staged like my uh my 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 daughter-in-law her great great grandpa when we found a photo of him and colorized it and it was very you know nice for her to see that and he's wearing a big got a blanket they got a feather and he just looks really cool um and and then i saw another photo of him uh, taken by the BIA about, you know, about 20 years later when you're much older, it's just like, yeah, you know, it's like the, you know, the, this was staged, this one wasn't staged. And, but at the same time, that stage photograph was very important because it's something that they, you know, now they can put that on their wall. It's a, a family heirloom. And yeah, I mean, I, I, I know it's, it's one of those things where how you have to kind of balance a tightrope on some of that stuff because some of the stuff's just not genuine, you know. And you know, but yet at the same time, you want those things to be. You know, you want people to be able to see 
you know, a variety of, uh, of images. You know, yeah. So yeah, uh, on that, do you have any tips for those of us who aren't tribal historic preservation officers to be able to identify a staged photo? Oh okay. yeah. Well, like I said, a lot of times, if it's around say 1898 going forward, um, it's almost certainly staged. You know, if they're wearing a lot of beadwork, uh, you know, you know that type of thing. There, that's when the when the studio photographers were really going gangbusters because at the same time you see a real wealth of boarding school photographs that 1890 to 1910 about a you know a good 10 to 20 year span where they stripped of their Indianness but at the same time those you know fathers, mothers, grandfathers, grandmothers are being put into, you know, heavy view with regalia. Why are you trying to show the civilization of one but at the same time tokenizing or fetishizing one? It, it, it was basically, yeah, that's what was happening. It's like, we want to preserve the real Indian as we destroy, you know, the Indian. And so it's, yeah, it's, that's the saddest part to see too with some of those boarding school pictures. It's like, ouch, you know, very, you know, it's very rare that you see a smile and it's when you think about what's been happening, like in Canada, they found a lot of, uh, uh, missing and murdered kids and yeah, it, it's pretty, you know, pretty, uh, awful, but still being able to bring those photographs and preserve them and promote them. I, I guess I don't really have too many boarding school photos that I've colorized just because it hurts. You know, my only picture is my grandma and she, you know, they look kind of happy, but at the same time, when you know what was going on in that photograph, it wasn't because they're dressing these kids up for fun. They're dressing these kids up to make money off of them. And at the same time, you think they were wearing those, when they got back to school, heck no. I heard all the fun stories from my grandma about, you know, everything that went on there. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't, you know, a good experience. And, you know, and so it, there's ethics that, you know, that you really have to look at too is, you know, what photographs, you know, do we promote? And boarding school photos, things like that, you don't want to promote them. But at the same time, like I said, at the same time, you have these boarding school photographs, you have these, staged photographs that are very much and people even here and now a lot of them, oh how cool that's really awesome and you know it's like wow but yeah it's you know like the one where this guy has the uh, a feather duster shoved into the back of his headband and i was like when i saw that, I was like, is that a feather duster i zoom it up oh god it is a feather duster you know because i suppose the guy used some feathers you know, it's all that, you know, nobody will know any better. You know, it's like, okay, cool. <laughs> but so you'll see that. Or these guys, some of these guys actually own things. And now here you have, uh, you look at some of these museum collections, even. Uh, some of these guys who were photo photographers donated a lot of their stuff to museums, uh, their beadwork, things like that. And they're on display still, you know, as being, you know, kind of, canonical to, <laughs> to that but in, in reality it's not you know it's uh you know these were props sometimes and so it, it just takes a little bit of understanding of the time period like i said I, my favorite photos are those 1930s photos going forward where you start to see that you know realistic um you know there's no more uh trying to do the noble savage or the disappearing Indian, you see a lot of those uh, CCC photos are people building their own infrastructure. Things that are still around now, it's like, this is the community center. Why, you know, here's people building it. Hey, that's my grandma who built that. My grandpa built that. And, you know, these are the photographs of those people who are building their own communities with their own hands. And it was documented. Now that means a lot to people, I think. And, it, you know, it's really good to see you know, those type of photographs, they really are, you know, and yet if you were to take those photographs and present them to, 
uh, mainstream society, they're going to say, well, who cares? You know, they're not be working deeds. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, you know, to me, it's like this is the those are the important pictures, or where some of those 1939, you know, photos where well, ladies out there wearing an apron, a dress, a coat, gloves, and she's tapping a, a maple tree. It's like she's tapping the maple tree, you know. She's actually doing culture. She doesn't have to be wearing beadwork and buckskin, you know what you're looking at is that culture that survived that cultural activity that's still practiced today and that's why i like those i really like those like i said those early photos where the delegations were wearing their suits and at the same uh, stuff with them or the like the ones where I knew the story of the why these guys are wearing these massive coats, and these coats are huge. It must have been uncomfortable in Washington, D.C., wearing a coat that big. But when you know, well, yeah, but when they left uh, North Dakota, it was 40 below, and they were walking 80 miles. It's like, sure, that coat makes a lot of sense. And so I like some, I like to know kind of what's going on in each one. That's why the studio pictures are a lot less satisfying to me. But at the same time, those are the great ones because they actually had people posing and staying still and they're clear and they're easy to colorize, they're easy to fix up, but they're not as satisfying as, you know, the person who is, you know, outside sitting there. And, you know, it's, yeah, so any other questions, Ruben? Yeah. Um, did, have you ever found any... Uh other historical photos of the young of the uh, Bible family uh, woman. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's some that where she's wearing a really nice uh, European dress. Oh. And you know that was really fun. It's really hard. I mean, I, I colorized it. Looks pretty cool. And I was able to clear it up, but it's not as good a quality because it was a little bit earlier. You know, time period wise, she was much younger. And I also found one of her when she was uh, much older in the 1950s. Uh, before she passed away when she was sitting in her kitchen in California. Mm -hmm. And that one I really liked. I would colorize that. I was like, this is cool, you know, to see that one. Because you see, you know, um, so, you know, slice of time and how she, you know, she was presented. At, like I said, the early one, she's wearing a European outfit. Then they fetishize her in the middle there. And then here she is wearing a, a rayon and, you know, looks like she's in the 1950s. It's just like, yeah, I mean, I think that is fascinating to see those different uh, slices of time. Or to find, like, I found, a, I found one picture of one of my great great grandmothers um, wearing a burlap sack dress. And it was just like, and she's wearing a hat. And, and it's just like, wow, that's neat. You know, it's just like, you know, she's just looked like she's just standing there in her yard. It was like, just before she must have died in like the 1950s, that picture was taken. And it's like, you know, really cool when you find that those old photos of your family, especially because uh, photography for a long time was, like I said, the convenience of the wealthy. You know, you had to pay to, you know, to get your photo taken. You had to travel a great distance to do it. That's why a lot of people don't have photos, but they do. They cherish the heck out of them. And then they also get, you know, mucked up, broken. I was fixing my, my, my uh, great uncle. Uh, when they were little babies, there's a picture of them, a studio picture. It took me like days to fix because there was a big crack going across it. And I had to, you know, pixel by pixel bring things in to clear it up and get that out of there and smooth it out. And it was like, a, ah, I, I succeeded. I won. I, I, I defeated the, 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 the crack. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, but it was nice to see because, you know, uh, every, you know my, my cousins were just like, hey, look, it's dad. I'm like, yeah. You know, this is from 19, you know, 20. We were able to fix that photograph up. One of my cousins had found it. She said, can you fix this? Can you fix this? I said, I'll do my darndest. <laughs> and I did it. And that was kind of cool. So, yeah. I'm just really impressed with the faces, the way they come out. I don't know if it's easier than I think it is to translate from black and white to color, but. No, I've. I I've, 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 I've put them through a lot of, a lot of. Um, I would go as a repetitive process, colorize them once, clear it up, blow it up, add some, uh, what do you call that? Uh, 
Oh, I can't remember the term. Uh, it, but where it, where it might try to reinforce the edges, then smooth it out. So it might go through, uh, you know, several processes with one, one photograph to get that to look. Where you go from black and white to be very blurry to be, you know, very clear, and that's really kind of cool because you really see like the Louis Riel picture. Or yeah, let me actually go back to this guy. Yeah, like he looks very good. It was a great picture to begin with. But yeah, I mean, to, and then a shadows like that, that's a tough, toughie. <coughs> you know, how do you make the skin look normal when half the space is in shadow and half the face is in sun? That that's a that's double tough. <laughs> oh I'd say. It goes from anywhere from 45 minutes to two days, you know, sometimes longer. Uh, I did one that was, uh, I'm sure you might have seen it, Marcus, the, uh, uh, after the Battle of Batash, where all those gentlemen are in uh, uh, leg chains and they're standing in front of uh, the barracks in Canada and you know, battle for like where a, a Saskatoon or Regina. But it was like about you know 15 individuals and they're trying to get them all to look good was double tough because there's a lot of people you know and not all of them translated really good to the camera and uh, that was one that i was really you know to this day i'm just like that was cool to do or even like the outdoor ones just to get the trees to look kind of cool without looking awful the grass sometimes it'll come out really blurry some parts will um, or, you know, and I don't have anything here that looks really blurry, which is kind of cool. Well, here, this is a good one. See, I couldn't, I couldn't really do much with them. They, you know, they were kind of at their max. It was such a small picture. Resolution matters. I mean, I can't take a small picture and make it look awesome uh, if it's really bad. So a lot of people say, can you, you know, fix this photo of my grandma for me? I'm like, sure. Send it to me in as high a resolution as you possibly can. Because you can always make a picture look you know, smaller and look great than to make a small picture look great because it's big. It loses all resolution. The pixels are massive and it doesn't work as well. And so this one I couldn't fix. I was able to get my grandma's face to look a little bit better. And there's, you know, some of their faces, but still some of the uh, features are washed out. You, can, you know, uh, I couldn't bring them out like I wanted to. I, I, that's one of the one of the fun things to do, though, is if you really bring a photo like the uh, uh, Louis Riel, where he goes from looking very flat to looking very 3D. That that was a an achievement. It really does look, you know. I mean, you can still see everything there, but the eyes, the expressiveness, the bags, the you know, the uh, mustache, the shading under his chin all that that was a lot of fun work but you know but it was a lot of work anything else uh, i just want to make a comment about uh, this uh, on the historian side so i just want to thank you for for doing this block about the moment uh, uh kid was one of our uh, tri uh was one of our uh, uh Advisors for the uh, exhibit, the 150th exhibit downstairs at Alpha Maniti Clay County at 150. So that's how we met one of our other advisors, Evan Schroeder. So you got to check out this, this this website. And and it's it's our our community here in the Red River Valley. I think has done a poor job of keeping our own history for so many years, and so it was really hard to find those indigenous stories but you have collected them over your life and you're making them available to the public and i just really thank you for that oh, thanks yeah and that really that's a lot of it it's just i want you know it's just a us you know i don't want to i don't want to write a humongous you know poem on red river history i'll leave that to you know ellen robinson or something but <laughs> um but really, I mean, just making history that's more visible, more approachable, more digestible. That's really, you know, the key. I just, I, I love it. I love you know, little 
goofy things like that. Uh, and, you know, and, and, you know, someday it'll pay off. I mean, for, you know, for people, you know, just hearing like this at some lady, so I read those stories to my kids at night. I was like, wow, that, that means something. That kid's going to maybe, you know, remember that and feel, yeah, exactly, tell his kid or even just an annual. Oh, did you know that this is where this happened? It's like, that's cool. Like, uh, I used to tell these guys, my kids never listened to me. It's like, hey, there's a battle that took place at the end of this river. Whatever, dad. <laughs> 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 but, you know, it's, you know, you hope. But, you know, it's just, you know, things like that. I mean, how, how can we just make it so our lives are just a little bit better? Because only have, you know, 75, 85, you know, years on the planet, you know, enjoy it while you can. And, um, you know, have it be fun, you know, and, and, you know, fulfilling and rich and vibrant. That's why I want to. At least not why I think. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Two choices. I submitted two uh, 